Welcome to this week's episode of Brainstorm, where we give you a glimpse into the world of science for this Wednesday, October 31st, 2012. We begin with a story from the world of biotechnology as it applies to the environment. Here on Brainstorm, we talk a lot about alternative fuels, and two reoccurring topics are hydrogen and biofuels. With current technology, they each have their own advantages and drawbacks. Depending on the type, a biofuel may be compatible with current infrastructure and machinery, but usually requires valuable agricultural land. Hydrogen is really clean and efficient, however storage is not perfect, and production currently requires extensive catalysts and an external electrical source. While these technologies will continue to develop separately, scientists at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory have begun investigating hydrogen production from microorganisms. Specifically, they studied cyanobacteria, which perform photosynthesis like algae and plants in a specialized bioreactor. They were able to grow the bacteria while having precise control over the conditions, such as the nutrient, gas, and light concentrations. Somewhat surprisingly, the cyanobacteria produced hydrogen gas consistently for 100 hours, under the conditions tested. It was surprising because previous work showed that oxygen gas generally interferes with enzymes that produce hydrogen gas. Although the enzyme in the cyanobacteria isn't normally meant for hydrogen production, but instead nitrogen fixing, turning nitrogen gas into ammonia. Fortunately for us, when the bacteria is grown in a nitrogen-deprived environment, the enzyme reacts with the different molecules to produce hydrogen. More work is needed, especially studying these microbes on a genetic and molecular level. However, this is an important first step and could lead to a reliable and literally green way of producing hydrogen fuel. Next is news from the world of medicine. As you may know, blood cells are produced in the bone marrow through the multiplication and differentiation of blood stem cells. Because this includes immune cells, a bone marrow transplant is often used to treat people with severely damaged or even non-existent immune systems. There are some issues with bone marrow transplants, such as graft versus host disease, which we discussed on Brainstorm a few weeks ago. However, Researchers at Duke University have discovered a protein that might make transplants more effective or even unnecessary in certain cases. Called pleiotrophin, it was originally discovered in mice, being secreted by the blood vessels in bone marrow. It acted as a homing signal to capture and retain stem cells and was likely a growth factor. Similar growth factors have been used as treatments, but they are for specific blood cell types. Based on both human and mouse cell cultures, pleiotrophin promotes the division of blood stem cells without differentiation. This increases the overall production of all blood cells. If proven safe, it could restore an immune system after damage or accelerate the integration of new stem cells after a transplant. As another interesting therapeutic use, antibodies that blocked pleiotrophin seem to dislodge stem cells from the marrow potentially leading to an effective way to collect the useful cells from the blood, rather than extracting from the bone. Our final story is an update from the world of material science, as it applies to energy technology. What you may not think about is the fact that most electricity is still based on steam turbines, which means condensers are extremely important as they're responsible for recycling the steam back into water for the turbine. So a team at MIT has developed a highly hydrophobic material to increase the efficiency of condensers. It's a combination of microtexturing, tiny micrometer-sized posts or bumps in the material surface, with the addition of a lubricant. Likely some kind of oil, the lubricant would stick to the surface, trapped between the microscale pattern by the capillary force. Together, they greatly increase the speed the water droplets slide down the condenser wall, this creates new space for more droplets to form faster, increasing the overall efficiency of the heat exchange. Creating these kinds of materials wouldn't be very expensive, only a small amount of lubricant is needed, and the pattern isn't complex. As an added bonus, this surface would protect the metal of the condenser from corrosion. More analysis will be necessary to determine the exact amount of increased efficiency. The MIT team also helped develop a new technique for imaging the water surface interface, because usually the water droplets get in the way. A droplet is rapidly frozen after it forms, cross-sectioned with an ion beam, then imaged with a scanning electron microscope. 
That technique will hopefully accelerate the implementation of this material, and it's not only useful for electricity production. It could also be used in the condensers of desalination plants, potentially increasing the rate of freshwater production. Well, hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please consider subscribing and be sure to check the links in the video description.